Welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur, and today it's my pleasure to be joined by Gary Tobbs. Now, Gary is one of the most influential people in the world of nutritional science and basically turning that science upside down on its head. With his publications of Good Calories, Bad Calories, Why We Get Fat, and The Case Against Sugar, I, I find it hard to find anybody who's done as much as Gary has to try and bring, bring truth and scientific truth into this world of nutritional science. But as you're going to hear in our discussion today, that's not an easy job. So he started off doing physics research and getting into science that way and has evolved into now being so deep in nutritional research and with creating this amazing company, Nusi, to try and find if he can get a single explanation for why we get fat. And as you're going to hear, it's been a bumpy road, but he's not giving up. You got to give Gary that. He's got a lot of resolve and he's going to keep forging ahead until he finds his answer. I think you're going to hear a lot about science in here, but you're also going to walk away with some, some good tidbits on what you can walk away with now about helping your health. And that's a big part of what we're trying to do here at the Diet Doctor podcast, to explain the science and also to give you the practical tips that you need. So if you want to know more, if you want to hear more about the episode, you can go to dietdoctor.com. You can learn more about me at lowcarbcardiologist.com. And don't forget, if you like this episode, please leave us a review and don't forget to click subscribe so you won't miss any of our future episodes. So stay tuned for my interview with Gary Tobbs. Gary Tobbs, welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I was so excited when you agreed to be a guest on this podcast because it's it's hard to overstate your impact on the whole low-carb world. And that was really brought out even more to my intention as we were emailing back and forth. And Andreas, the diet doctor himself, said, you are the reason I got started doing this in the first place. I mean, if that doesn't say your influence on this field, I don't, I don't know what does. And when you started on this journey so many years ago, did you have any concept of what you would create and the people you would impact? Uh, no. No. Clearly really? no. No, this was all... I wasn't just clueless. It was just, you know, I was just a journalist following a story. So um, it's really, it's kind of, I mean, it's, yeah, it's very cool to say. Right. So, but I... I was making it up as I went along. Actually, I think we're all still making it up as we go along because there's never really been a phenomenon like this. But, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. And your your path to get here is so interesting because you certainly didn't start in nutrition research. It doesn't seem like your goal was to get involved in nutrition and how that impacts health, but rather you started off in physics and, and talking about science and and that connects so well to this because we're still talking about science, whether it's good calories versus bad calories or good science versus bad science. So tell us a little bit about your journey, how you went from starting in physics and how you found your way over to the nutrition world. Okay. Well, I'm going to also give you a different, uh, interesting revelation on this because <clears throat> people had discovered this before, right? But they were invariably physicians and they were overweight and they were trying to figure out how to solve their weight problem. And when they did, they decided they would try to solve their patients' weight problems. And when it worked, they wrote diet books. And then they became sort of tarred as diet book doctors. And the idea was a diet book doctor is kind of equivalent to a, um, you know, like a snake oil salesman. And it was just, you know, personal observation. I was probably the first one who got into it because I was an investigative journalist. I mean, I was just... Uh, as you pointed out, I had started in science. I had written my first two books about first physicists who discovered non-existent elementary particles and then this cold fusion phenomenon where chemists discovered a non-existent physical you know, uh, phenomena. And I was obsessed with how hard it is to do science right. And that was what really interested me. I had started my career in physics. And investigative reporting is similar to science and you're trying to realize something about the universe that nobody else knows and understands. So my physics friends had suggested if I was interested in the subject, I should look at the public health science in general because it was based on some pretty shoddy research. And I stumbled into the diet field. Um, it was pure serendipity. I was I needed a paycheck one day. And my editor at Science uh, asked me if you know I wanted to do a story on the first... Uh, DASH study. DASH is a dietary approach to stop hypertension. So I um, 
In the course of doing that story, I realized that there was a very vitriolic controversy over whether salt causes high blood pressure. And um, <laughs> in the course of interviewing people, I realized that one of the worst scientists I'd ever interviewed was took credit not just for getting Americans to avoid salt, but for getting us on the low-fat diet we'd all been eating through the 90s. And I, the learning experience from my other... Um, my physics and cold fusion and all my other research was that bad scientists never got the right answer. So when right. I realized this guy was involved in the dietary fat concept, I didn't even think of it as a controversy. I was just doing what everyone else was doing in the 90s, which was eating low-fat diets. I, you know, I joke that over the course of the 90s, I probably boiled 10,000 eggs and threw out 10,000 yolks because <laughs> that's what we did. You yeah. know, that was a... I mean, it was crazy. And then you start researching this question about whether dietary fat causes heart disease. And it turns out to have been an interesting hypothesis that went nowhere and that we embraced anyway because so many people became intellectually and cognitively committed to it that they couldn't believe whenever their experiments did not confirm it. They just assumed they did the experiments wrong. Right, and that's such and, an important point that you, you talk about bad scientists and bad science. And, and one of the things about your backstory that I think is so interesting, when you started, you were actually working with like a Nobel Prize winning scientist. And that was part of the, your foray into bad science, which, which makes me think, are there bad scientists or do people just get so ingrained and so unwrapped in their own science that they really can't see outside of that? And... And it, it leads them to fall into traps, like the trap of thinking salt causes hypertension, which causes cardiovascular disease, or that fat causes cardiovascular disease, that people are just, they're too close to it. They're too ingrained in it. And it takes someone like you, someone who's quote unquote, an outsider to come in and, and pull back the wool over our eyes and show us the truth. Well, that's why traditionally major advances in science are made by people who come from outside the field. Because when you're inside the field, you learn to think the way everyone else thinks. And it, there's a, I've been fascinated by the whole groupthink phenomenon, which I think explains a lot of this. Like the reason you and I <clears throat> are talking today and the reason we think we like each other and is because we think the same way. So I assume you're a really smart guy because you think like I do. Of course. You know, and people don't think like I do, I assume are not smart. And that's just the way humans work. So we surround ourselves, this conference where we're doing this meeting is a whole mess of people all think alike and we all think we're smart because we all agree with each other. And if it turns out we're wrong, we'll never be able to admit it because it's all these people who this is where we get our feedback from. This is where we get our, our validation from. These are the people who, you know, you said, what an amazing part I've played in this. And I'm thinking, yeah, as long as I'm right. Right. I used to have a friend in Hollywood, a screenwriter, who used to joke that if I'm wrong, I'm going to have to go and live in Argentina with all the other people who were killed hundreds of thousands, you know. Right. <clears throat> I think it's clear. Witness protection program yeah, for exactly. Gary Tubbs. It's how humans function. The, the guy I wrote my first book about, I lived at CERN, the big European physics lab outside of Geneva, and I thought I was there to cover a great breakthrough. There's a few things we all do. I mean, first of all, this guy suffered one of the flaws. He was an uh, uh, Italian physicist who taught at Harvard and commuted between Harvard and Geneva and Italy and yeah, won the Nobel Prize when I was there for work that he had done earlier. Um, fatal flaw of many very, very, very smart people is because they're used to being the smartest person in the room and they're very, very, very smart. They often think they're smarter than they are. And so they forget that the first principle of science is that you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. Right. Um, and then once you begin this process of fooling yourself, so you see something in the data that you think is a discovery about the laws of the universe, whether it's, you know, an elementary particle or the idea that saturated fat causes heart disease, as soon as you go public with that, it's like you're committing. So what you're supposed to do in science is test your hypotheses, rigorously test your hypothesis. Think basically spend however long it takes to come up with every possible explanation for what you saw to 
explain it away as something mundane and boring and, and not interesting and a mistake because why would the universe be so kind as to allow you to discover something that no one else had Great ever seen before? And so if you think you have, you're almost assuredly wrong and they think that you should just find out how you're wrong and you should ask every smart person you know to explain why you're wrong because clearly you're wrong. That's so, kind of the way you should approach it. Um, if you were going to grade contemporary science on how well they do that, what kind of grade would you give them? Yeah, D plus. D plus? Yeah. And <laughs> You're being generous? <laughs> well, again, it's sort of, we got into the situation where in order to get funding, you have to tell people why you're right. Yeah. And you have to find new things. And you have to publish new papers all the time. That's how you get career advancement. That's how you get promoted. And that's how you get funding. So and that's how you get published. Uh, we joke that no one's ever, apparently no one's ever published a negative result. Nobody ever disproved a hypothesis, certainly not their own, and yet that's what you're supposed to do in science. That's you're what supposed science to be should do. Your, um, so in this guy, once you go public, once you take that first step, so in physics, the way I was taught is you, after months or years of trying to prove you're wrong, you finally, you say, I can't, I can't do it. I can't figure out how to explain this other than a great discovery. So then, you write a paper that says discovery of fundamental particle X question mark. And then you write the papers like clearly I screwed up here and clearly this is some mundane thing that I like some problem with my equipment or some mundane phenomena that's been reported 50 times before and I'm just not aware of and please explain how but I haven't figured it out so I'm going to kind of present this paper. So you're kind of backing into it and then when people say oh well you forgot you know that when you calibrated your equipment by you know plugging it into that wall socket you thought the voltage was 110 volts and it was 108 and so you were getting sparks and that's why you you know. So it's and the it, mindset with which you approach the the data and that mindset is not the mindset we have today. The mindset today is, here's what I've proven. Aren't I great? Look at these wonderful results. Yeah, look at these results. And I yeah. hear this, I mean, it's just how we work. Um, I've almost decided that I'm, I think I'm going to, I'm tempted to start sort of making my own internal assessments of people's intelligence by how many question marks they use when they speak and in emails. Because if they're not asking questions but just giving declarative statements, they're probably not... They don't understand how easy it is to fool yourself right. and that they're likely doing that and they should be, you know, approaching life and their science differently. But anyway, that's that's what I think about. I, yeah. I, all of my books I think of is ultimately about this question of good science and bad science yeah. and how to present hypotheses. And the problem with these public health hypotheses like dietary fat cause and heart disease, you know, 500,000 Americans are dying every year from heart disease, you want an answer. Right. You want to be able to prevent this so you feel this pressure to come up with an answer to, to, to suddenly shortcut the scientific process and jump to conclusions. Because if you're right, you're going to save hundreds of thousands of lives. And if you're wrong, how much damage can you do? And the problem like is you, out. you never know how much damage yeah. you could do. So. Yeah. And, and one of the th things about science is how it reacts to, I guess you could say, outsiders and how it reacts to contrarian information. And you are pretty much on the forefront of that. So when you first came out with What If It's All Been a Big Fat Lie, uh, was that 2004? 2002. Oh, 2002. Sorry. July 7th. All right, 2002. Not that I remember. Yeah, right. Uh, there was quite a uh, storm of reactions to that. And I mean, you can look at it a, at a couple of different ways. You could say, well, how are scientists supposed to react to opinions or hypotheses that are contrary to their own? And what would you answer just to that question? How are they supposed to react? Extreme skepticism. I mean, it's again, this is, this is the problem. So I think of it as, you know, you're in a situation where there's an infinite number of wrong answers and only a few right ones. Yeah. So the likelihood of getting the right answer is always tiny. And, and I'd like to think, remember my, my second book was on this phenomenon called fusion where there's this chemist in Utah and this electrochemist in, in Britain thought they had discovered a new kind of nuclear fusion in effect that could be limited energy. And if it was right, it meant all the, everything we knew about physics, basically nuclear physics had to be rewritten. And you, know, you trust the establishment. 
I mean, these guys are smart guys. They know what they're doing. And they, the difference is nuclear physics is exceedingly well tested. You know, I mean, you can you come up with theories and hypotheses and equations, and then you could build bombs and reactors. And for the most part, they work. Yeah. So we know our ideas are correct. Um, but you trust the establishment. And so the establishment, and what well, we said most breakthroughs come from outsiders. Those outsiders are a tiny percent of the outsiders who are thinking about the subject. And so I, when I used to write for Discover Magazine in the 80s, and I wrote these, every time I wrote a story about physics, I would get these letters they written in crayon um, from, I realized 10 years later they're written in crayons because they're written by prisoners, convicts who aren't allowed to have sharp objects. Really? <laughs> and they would explain they had their theories of the universe. Um, oh, wow. You know, that, that, well, I have a grand unified theory, and then they'd work it out. And for all I know, there's some one of them was right. Yeah. But life is short, and I don't have time right. to read, you know, yeah. the chances are they're wrong. Well, I, I guess the, so. the, the point where I was going with this, though, was to say, I think if you're a scientist and someone wants to challenge your theory, you should you should greet that challenge and say, okay, if, if science is the goal, let's see if this is right or not. And But yet that's sort of the opposite of the reaction that you got. Instead, it seems like you got a very personal and defensive reaction to your to your hypothesis and your publications. Yeah, well, the very first thing, yeah, absolutely. When I wrote, what if it's all been a big fat lie? Um, yeah, I was kind of, I knew it was gonna be controversial. I was kind of stunned by the response. But again, if I was right, every journalist, not just every scientist covering this, but every journalist covering this field was wrong. They had missed a huge story, including some of my friends. So you got pushed back within the journalistic community as well as the scientific. Back from one of my close friends in journalism, who used to think of me as one of the three best science journalists in the business, accused me of having a brain transplant, of basically writing the article to get a big book deal. Wow. Um, because if I was right, she was wrong. Yeah. If I was right, Gina Collada at the New York Times was wrong. If I was right, uh, Sally, I forget her name, at the Washington Post was wrong. All mm. these people, you know, Jane Brody was wrong. All these people who had been covering nutrition and the, the confluence with obesity and chronic disease were wrong. Yeah. So it wasn't just the scientists. Yeah, but I guess... It, it was the, the gatekeepers who were the journalists. So, and so a lot of the pushback came from actually my journalist friends. The scientists just said, who cares? Well, the scientists tried to discredit you and just say, well, you're a journalist. What do you know about science? And, and that part I find so interesting because the scientists sort of know their study. But right. you as a journalist, you came in with the perspective of history and you came in the perspective of, of breath to look at the whole field, which scientists don't do and nor do they have the time or the training to do. So I find it interesting when they say, well, you're a journalist, you don't have a, a, a place here, but whose job is that? Whose job is it? Is well, it the- funny, there isn't, yeah. There's, and then even in science journalism, there's... There's, and personally, actually medicine, there's very little role for journalists. So in, in politics and in government, um, in any other field in sports, we see the role of the journalist as, uh, as the fifth estate, to, to, uh, part of the system of checks and balances. But in medicine, that doesn't really exist. Science Magazine was actually one of the few places where I could work that would allow this kind of investigative reporting. The New England in medicine, like the New England Journal of Medicine doesn't, have reporters who write for it and JAMA actually ha used to have, maybe they still do, but they really had very, there was very little role for journalists to come in and there's more of a wall where there's this idea there's, you know, scientific medical expertise is different. You know, you got to get degrees, right? You know, MDs and PhDs. It's not like okay. government where you're going after people or at your same educational level. Um, so, and then people don't like to hear from outsiders, period. But even then, if, I mean, Linus Pauling with vitamin C, I mean, he was the ultimate insider and people still didn't listen to him. And we still don't know if he was right or not. I suspect not, but it's not a subject I know well. Yeah. So, but the point is, remember, having written about cold fusion, and after cold fusion, I did the first big piece I did for um, 
in public health was on the question of whether electromagnetic fields cause cancer. And you want the medical scientific community to have a very good immune system. Because remember, once a quackish idea gets into the system and infects the way people think, it doesn't go away. It stays there forever and you never know. It's like herpes or something. You never know how it's going to come out and manifest and influence science later. And so this process, when you talk about science is laying bricks on, you know, on a wall, you want that wall has to be as solid as humanly possible. If there's a, anywhere I'm shifting metaphors wildly, but if there's, you know, any place in the wall where you've got a, 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 you know, a series, like a half a dozen shoddy bricks, the whole wall could come down. So you want the medical community and the scientific community to be very vigorous in defending themselves against quackery. Right. And that's, like I said, that's why you don't want scientists going public with premature results, because then if somebody should forget that this is basically somebody's speculation and assume it's a fact and then it gets built into the scientific edifice, other people are going to build on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get, it's going to infect everything. And that's what happened with the dietary fat science. It's what happened with the obesity. They just embraced these assumptions, never really confirmed them, allowed them to become facts and they've infected everything that comes after. But you want... I don't mind the way I was treated, and I don't mind the way I'm still treated because that's their job. My job, if I'm going to take this on, my job is to weather the slings and arrows, you know, and to just keep doing it. And I try to, my personal goal is not to become bitter right. and not to be one of these people who's, you know, eaten away by the fact that people want to ignore people. Like, you want them to ignore people like me. But in an ideal world, you want them to not have screwed up so monumentally to begin with that they need right. people like me. And that's exactly it. I mean, they would, the scientists would say, you're an outsider, you don't belong here. But it's so obvious how much we needed someone like you to come along because there aren't the systems of checks and balances. And for the government to lay down nutritional guidelines that you can say are complicit in obesity and diabetes epidemic with no checks and balances... I mean, I think that's exactly why we need so-called outsiders like you to come in and, and turn things upside down. Yeah. And what it clearly has shown is the difficulty in performing nutritional studies. I mean, I think there's no question it's a, it's a difficult field to begin with. And so to think that we can have evidence that's strong enough to make governmental guidelines for how everybody should eat is just is at fault from the beginning. Well, this is, yeah, it's... Um it's a fascinating conundrum. So, and I, I remember I wrote about this, and I think it was the second chapter of Good Calories, Bad Calories. And when I wrote about this, at the end of it, I sent it off to my editor, and I said, this is either the best thing anyone's ever written on this subject, or it's just crazy rambling. I never know what the different, like my talk today is either going to be very revelatory or crazy rambling. Yeah. Um, in retrospect, how would you how would you say you did? <laughs> I think it was pretty good. Um, I agree. agree. But the, the, so on the one hand, you've got like this physician's perspective. We've got people dying out there. I, I often think of it as a Jurassic Park concept because if you remember the first Jurassic Park movie, there's about six people, six place in the movie where somebody screams, "People are dying out there. We have to act." Right. right. They're dropping dead as we speak. As you and I have had this conversation, seven Americans have dropped dead of heart attacks and we didn't Good act point. and we're complicit. So we have to act. Yeah. And we don't have time. One of the things I heard and you read in the, when reading the, the, the journalism from the year of the 1960s, we don't have time to dot the I's and cross the T's. The other thing is, if you don't have time, it's the scientific perspective. If you haven't dotted the I's and crossed the T's, you don't know if you're right. right. It's that simple. You don't know if you're right. And so these two philosophies are at war, and they're still at war, except what happened in this particular field, the studies, as you pointed out, they're very hard to do because you're studying chronic diseases that um, manifest themselves over decades. Right. Slowly. So it's not enough to, you could do a study for six months, you could do it over the, the, the rat or mouth you know, uh, equivalent of decades, but you don't really know if what you're seeing, like if you see changes happen in six months, maybe the body, you know, uh, compensates and it doesn't manifest as chronic disease 20 or 30 years later. And maybe the ones that it does manifest, you don't see actually some of the stuff I left out of good calories, bad calories was studies done in, um, in, uh, weaning rodents, pups, on their mother's milk, and you change their mother's milk, the con carbohydrate content of the mother's milk while they're weaning, they're called pup-in-a-cup experiments. And in middle age, they manifest metabolic syndrome. So they appear to be completely normal. 
really? for the first year of their life, and then which is, becomes middle age for a mouse or a rat, and then they manifest metabolic syndrome. And if they're females, they pass it on to their infants when they get pregnant. Yeah. So, and you wouldn't see it for the first year. So this is the problem. You just have no idea. To do the studies right requires 50,000, 100,000 people followed for 10 years. That's a billion-dollar study. And it's so hard to get free-living people to follow your diets that you might, they might not even stick on the diets or the control diet people might. I mean, there are all kinds of ways they can get the wrong answer. Right. And they, they argued about this and discussed it in the 60s. So they decide not to do the science. And then what they do is instead of acknowledging that they don't really know, say, look, we're guessing. This is what they should have said. We're guessing. And the public wouldn't have re responded well to that's, that. That's the point. They if you confidence. say we're guessing, but we don't think you should ever eat butter or hamburgers again. Yeah. People are going to say, look, they're guessing. So you, then you're not going to get enough change, so you have to be forceful. But in essence, they were guessing. They yeah. were guessing. And so what they did is they also lowered their standards. And this is my condemnation of the field in general. Instead of saying, you know, if we don't do these studies, we don't know the truth, they said we can know the truth without doing those studies. We can triangulate to the truth. We could guess it's too important not to. And then they taught that to their students, and you have this whole culture of science that's now kind of a pseudoscience because they've lost, the, they don't realize that the, they're the easiest people to fool and they must not fool themselves. They don't realize that they're likely to be fooling themselves and they're not worried about it. They're not anxious. They're not staying up at night wondering if they've killed hundreds of thousands right. of people. They're just, they just convince themselves they were right by a much lower standard than was necessary and we're living with it. And so what it will take to undo that is good science to try and counteract that. And that's where we can sort of fast forward in your career to the, the creation of NUSI. And so I want to get into this a little mm -hmm. bit because, I mean, at the outset, it's uh, it's sort of a dream team of people mm -hmm. wanting to create good science to finally say this is what data shows and this is what science shows. And backed by good funding with high-profile people, how could it not succeed? And I think one thing, if I can speak for you, that you've learned is this is hard to do. It was probably much harder than you would have thought. So I want to get your opinion on that, on, on sort of your, your retroscope on how things have gone so far and what you've learned from it. And then we'll talk a little bit about the specifics of the studies. Okay. So when we started NUSI, we being me and then Peter Atia, um, we were clueless. Okay. My thinking was you have a problem. People had always gone on these diets. So here's the situation. The, the American Heart Association had, had staked out this position that this is quackery. Bizarre concepts of nutrition. Doctors, cardiologists in particular, are taught that this will kill people. It's high saturated fat. You're gonna, arteries are going to clog in a blink of an eye and you're going to keel over dead. Um, and yet... Even the researchers knew. When I did my first research for my first article, I had some of the leading research in the field saying, oh, yeah, of course, you, if you want to lose weight easily, go on Atkins. But I would never tell my patients right. to do it because I'm going to kill them. I can't risk it. And the heart associations are telling them, so the organizations and the guidelines are all pushing low-fat diets. And ultimately, the, the organizations, the institutions, the guidelines are responding to what the scientists in quotation marks, if I ever use the word scientists to air quotes, are telling them. So, and when, once you start seeing all the things they missed, so the primary thing, I mean, not just the evidence, their failure to confirm this idea that dietary fat caused heart disease, but the sort of nonsensical nature of this obesity theory that it's caused by taking in more energy than we expend. Um, my favorite physicist, Wolfgang Pauli, would have said that's not even wrong. That's how bad it is. And yet we all believe this. I believe that everyone believes it. It's like if somebody's getting fatter, they have to take in more energy than they expend. I mean, the fact that they're getting heavier tells you they're taking in more energy than they expend. The two things are synonymous in effect. They're tautologies. It doesn't tell you why they're getting heavier. Anyway, more than a growing child takes in more energy than expends tells you why they're growing. Right. You know, so it's sort of that idea had to go away to make progress. So the calories in, calories out The model, calories out model of obesity has to go away for this field to make, it's the wrong 
paradigm. It's a wrong way to think about it. This is a hormonal regulatory disorder. So the counter argument is the carbohydrate insulin model where it's more about the carbohydrates and the hormones, specifically insulin and how that affects. I like to think the carbohydrate insulin model is a subset of the, when we talk about this as a hormonal regulatory defect and then the tie to diet becomes carbohydrates through insulin. So the dietary trigger and how to think about preventing it becomes carbohydrates and insulin and other hormones are involved. Glucagon's probably involved growth hormone. But but if you think about it as a calorie problem, you will never make progress. That was my conclusion from my book. I never thought we needed experiments to clarify that, but clearly... I'm not going to convince all these researchers who I'm decided I'm a journalist. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, in, you know, they. And so, and I still don't think. I th- I think this is just pure logic. I mean, it's just like look at the history, understand what happened, right. understand that the calorie model doesn't tell you anything. It's a failure as a hypothesis. It can't tell you anything about fattening other than this idea that if you got fat, you ate too much. You know, but and, you can certainly see why it was promoted by Coca Cola and Snack Wells oh, and the other companies. By, but the scientists believe that. That's yeah. the thing. So maybe we can convince them. This was my thinking. If we could do an experiment where you fix calories and radically change the macronutrient composition, I kind of knew what experiment had to be done. I was giving lectures where I was proposing this experiment to researchers. And then when Peter Atiyah came along as somebody who had basically experienced the same phenomena in his own life, like if you want to understand why it's not about calories, you just have to be somebody who's been getting fatter for years, no matter how much you exercise, in Peter's case, three hours a day. And you know, counting your calories and being hungry all the time, and then you shift what you eat and the weight goes away. And it's like, it's not about calories, it's not is about it? Calories. I mean, so if you're willing to experiment, you can have this phenomenon yourself. But even if you did, so patients would go on these diets, they'd lose weight. They'd go to their doctor and they'd say, look, I lost 60 pounds. And the guy's the doctor would say, how'd you do it? And he'd say, Atkins. And the doctor would say, oh my God, you're killing yourself. Right. Stop. I get emails to still about, I lost 60 pounds, you know, 15 years ago. My doctor talked me out of the diet. So we needed to approach the medical community. We had needed to somehow shift the science so that the organizations would stop saying what they're saying, so that the doctors would stop saying what they're saying, so then the people could at least feel free to eat in a way that seemed to put their obesity into remission. So the the first study that you guys instituted, basically the energy balance study, where um, measuring people's resting energy expenditure and having them change their diet from sort of a normal diet to a low-carb diet, seeing how the energy expenditure changes. And this is one of the interesting things about science is that, you know, if you, if you Google the study and reviews of the study, most would say it was a failure. Certainly the, uh, the primary investigator said it, it was a failure, but actually energy fair- expenditure did change. It actually did change. Okay, the so- energy, energy expenditure went up on the low-carb diet, yet the interpretation was that it, it disproved the hypothesis. And it seems like a disconnect there, doesn't it? Yeah, well, this is where I get mystified, and they would just say that I can't accept reality. Um, so, yeah, this study, the idea was pretty simple. You take... Subject. So what you have to do in these studies, and it's very careful. If you don't do this, you don't get the right. So the key thing to remember in all discussions about science is that the answers you get depend on the questions you ask. And in this case, the questions are asked in an experiment. So the experimental conditions pose a question. So you have to define, you have to create the experimental conditions in such a way that you're asking the right question. So we're saying that uh, fat accumulation is dependent on, ultimately, on the macronutrient content of the diet, not the caloric content. So the conventional thinking says obesity is caused by taking more calories than you expend. Therefore, the only way that weight influences, foods influence your weight is through their caloric content, and then secondarily through how much of the calories in the food ultimately get absorbed and how much get, you know, expended in, in, in metabolism and, and excreted. Right. Um, <clears throat> so this conventional wisdom of a calorie is a calorie for the most part. So if you fix protein and you 
create a condition where, let's say, I, I realize that you need 3,000 calories a day to maintain your weight on a standard American diet, which is maybe 50% carbs and you know 35% fat and 15% protein. <coughs> and then I shift your diet to a ketogenic diet, and now I make it you know, 5% carbs and 80% fat and 15% protein. The conventional wisdom says, for the most part, the calorie is a calorie. It doesn't matter. Your weight's going to stay the same, and you're, you're going to expend the same amount of energy. And this alternative hypothesis, a subset the carbohydrate insulin model, says if we drop carbohydrates away to almost nothing and replace it with fat, we're going to drop insulin. And if we drop insulin, you're going to mobilize fat from your fat tissue and you're going to oxidize that fat. And there's no law of nature that says that you can't burn more calories in your eating. So your energy expenditure is now going to go up and we can measure carefully that energy expenditure. So that was the idea. And we recruited thoughtful researchers from the community who we thought could do that experiment and would pay attention to the data, and particularly individuals who, in the course of my interviews with them for my book, I thought had run up against the cognitive dissonance of their belief system. So, for instance, Eric Ravison, who was a researcher, at, still is at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center, had done research in uh, with the Pima Indians, this Native American tribe in, in, in um Arizona. I'm blanking. Too many concussions as a youth. Too much and, boxing. Yeah, and the Pima, he had said, you know, these people, they were getting obese and diabetic, and no population was more aware of the price of being diabetic. Like, they had the kids who were watching their parents get amputated, yeah. their legs amputated in their 30s. If any population knew enough to, to, to avoid obesity, it was this population. And yet they, it was happening to them anyway. So I, he would say things like that. And I thought, this is a man who's struggling with cognitive dissonance. Mm. And so if he sees a way out, if he does the right experiment, sees the data, understands that he's been laboring under literally the wrong paradigm, they'll shift. And Rudy Leibel at Columbia University was another one, a very thoughtful, wonderful researcher who I was convinced. And then we brought in some other people who were involved, including this, this young researcher at NIH, Kevin Hall, and another colleague of Eric's who was, had moved to a different laboratory, Steve Smith. And the idea was to get them to, to design this experiment with us, and then they would do the experiment and see. And it was but so open-minded, yeah. talented researchers with a, a mission that's laid out by you and Peter in this, in this type of environment, and, and still the study couldn't be as clear as you would hope it to be. Well, the first study we did was a pilot study. So we knew it could, this is where I get mystified. Yeah. We knew it could, it was not a randomized controlled trial. So you, you take these 17 right. subjects, you lock them away where you could fix how much, you could figure out how much energy they need to maintain their weight by measuring their energy expenditure, if they're expending 2,700 calories a day, you know, you got to feed them 20, or they got to at least absorb 2,700 calories from the food you feed them. And then you could shift them from a standard American diet to a ketogenic diet and see if this, you see this effect in energy expenditure, which should be easier to measure than an effect in weight. And uh, we did the full-scale study we knew it was going to cost around $20 million. We didn't trust it. We didn't want to spend $20 million going in on an experiment that could go awry. So instead, we, did the, we got $5 million to do this pilot study that, among its many issues, wouldn't be randomized. Yeah. So if you don't randomize the subjects, that just means you literally can't infer causality. There's no randomization. There's no causality. Any scientific methodologists will tell you that. You can't trust your results because you don't know if what you saw happened because you shifted the diet or, when, how, or how much of what you saw happened because after four weeks on any diet, locked away in a metabolic ward, something else happens that could explain what you saw. And remember, science is about making sure that what you say explains what you saw really was explains what you saw. So anyway, that was one of the many problems with the right. study. And yet, you know, the, the researchers chose. And so they did see a, they measured energy expenditure two different ways. One was in a metabolic chamber that is very accurate, but you're locking these people away in a small room for two days. And there's a lot of evidence that when you do that, it some, does something to inhibit their energy expenditure. 
So that's flawed. And then they also measured it by something called doubly labeled water, where you could measure their energy expenditure over two weeks, which isn't as accurate. But now at least they're walking around the wards. You get a accurate measurement of, or a, a measurement of their energy expenditure without this, whatever this possible inhibitory effect of the chamber is. Um, we have papers written by these researchers where they say that the doubly labeled water is the gold standard. There are papers written by the same researchers where they say the metabolic chamber is. So the metabolic chamber, they see a little bit of an increase in energy expense. And by a little bit, I mean they see about 60 to 100 calories a day, which would be more than enough by a factor of 10 to explain the obesity epidemic. But it seems to be going down at the end of the study. They don't really see it. Therefore... They decide that it's transient and it refutes the hypothesis. And then by the doubly labeled water, they see about three times that effect. And they also, they, there are things they don't measure, there are things that yeah. they are part of this energy balance. And so to us, it was an interesting experiment. Actually, part the reason we funded it, the major reason we funded it was to see if the methodology worked. And one of the decisions was the methodology did not work. And mm. so when we went around to, to design the follow-up study, we had to do a different methodology that got around the problem with the pilot. There are just all kinds of problems. So the, this whole discussion, though, just shows how complex this is. And it makes it so challenging for the individual out there who's trying to make decisions on what they're going to eat yeah. today, what they're going to eat tonight, what their lifestyle is going to be like. How do you decide when even the best intentioned and thoughtful scientists have problems coming up with conclusions? And I think... Well, they didn't have any problem coming yeah. up with a conclusion. We had problems coming up with the, with right the conclusion, conclusion they came up with. And right. then they said, well, of course we did because we're biased. Yeah. And we said, yeah, but you guys are... Anyway. And yeah. then there's the whole concept, though, of a study looking at such a specific thing versus looking at results in free living populations. And right. does one mean the other? And, you know, as a cardiologist, as a clinician, I could argue that I don't care what model works in science. I care what works for an individual patient. And that also makes science a little bit challenging. <clears throat> uh, did you run into any, any feedback or pushback about that, that this is just too overly controlled, not real world, and maybe not applicable to the person? Well, if we had seen what we wanted to see, and we'd argue we did see what we expected to see, and they just neglected to publish, to pay attention to that. Um, there's a knee-jerk response as to all of this. So if we had seen what we expected to see, um, and it had been a bigger effect, and they had published it, then people would have responded, yeah, but this is an artificial metabolic ward. And yeah. we would have said, but that's not what we were doing the study. It was a scientific study. It wasn't a public health study. It wasn't a medical study. It was science. We're using humans as our experimental animals because humans are the only ones we care about. And we want to establish which one of these vitally important paradigms is correct. Because if we're right, you got the wrong paradigm, you got the wrong hypothesis, that's why we have obesity and diabetes epidemics, that's why everyone fails, vitally important. Um, so you can do these free living studies where you're now doing you know, a study to see which diet works better in a free living environment. Those have always been plagued by a failure of people to follow the diets, which then leads to the medical community's knee-jerk response Nobody follows a diet. We know they don't follow a diet, so who cares? So what's your follow-up study then? What would be the study that can help that person decide what am I, what lifestyle am I going to follow? What am I going to have for dinner today? Okay, so I do have a follow-up study that I'm hoping to raise money for um, that I'm not going to talk about right now just because I want to... You're killing me. <laughs> you know, uh, we'll talk about it off the air. Okay. The, um, I mean, people, if I can raise money for it, I mean, it's crazy. I was just talking to... Um, my new friends at Wired Magazine, which is a long story. And they, you know, kept saying, well, clearly you're trying to keep Nusi alive for something. And, you know, there's a purpose to it and you're doing all these things. And, and you know, what's your logic? And I kept saying, look, I, ultimately I am a journalist, a freelance journalist and a book author who is now trying to raise three to five million dollars for a clinical trial. Nobody's ever done this before. I have no idea what it's possible. I am making this up as I go along. Okay, there's no book I can order on Amazon about how, uh, you know, private individuals can raise four million or five million dollars for clinical trials. And when we started NUSI, it was the same thing. I mean, Peter, I... I 
you know, I joke, it was like the Hardy Boys start not for profit. I mean, Peter's an amazing guy and incredibly talented, and he made it, you know, kind of what it was. But we didn't know what we were doing. And the foundation that was funding us, bless their heart, which gave us, you know, ultimately about $30 million to fund research and then funded another $12 million to a study that's kind of the follow-up to this energy balance study. Um, I think when they started, they didn't know what they were doing either. They were, they were a new organization. They were, you know, we all had the best intentions, and we were making it up as we went along. What do we think is the right thing to do at this moment? Um, that said, for your patient, this is how the world's changed, and I think this is vitally important. Um, when you talked about me not knowing when I got into it. So when I started this business in 2001, started my research for the Times Magazine story, the conventional wisdom was that if you want to lose weight, you went on a low-fat, calorie-restricted diet. You could eat things like fruit smoothies. You're you know? healthy like fruit you smoothies. To, I, there was one point in my life I wanted to open a Jamba Juice uh, franchise. Lines you know? out like, the door, right? I mean, and because they're, they're fat-free. Yeah. Who cares if they're like 2,000 calories? Or right. you know, It's clearly what you do. Um, anyway, that was a convention. Low-fat, calorie-restricted diet, and a low-carb diet will kill you. It was for a physician to prescribe it was equivalent to committing murder. It was quackery, and people's arteries were going to clog, and even if your patient lost 50 pounds on right. it, you got worried and tried to talk him out of it. And Dean Ornish and was saying things like, yeah, sure, you could lose weight on the Atkins diet, but you could lose weight on Fenfen too, which was this notoriously fatal diet drug, or by smoking cigarettes, or doing, you know. Cocaine binges, it's been yeah. related to. Right. That's what it was, that was and, a metaphor. I mean, it's funny, you you still see that recently uh, Mark Bittman and David Katz in New York Magazine compared it to cholera. I'm going to yeah. talk about this in my... I was provoked. It actually motivated me to use an emoji in my lecture today. Um, I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, so <laughs> the... Uh, but that was, a, that was a conventional wisdom. Now the arguments among the, the blogosphere is, is a low-fat diet as good as a low-carb diet? Yeah. And stop telling us everyone has to do low-carb. The conventional wisdom, at least in the more educated areas of the world, higher socioeconomic, the world where I live, I don't know if this is true everywhere, but the world I live now is that carbohydrates are fattening. And it seems like everybody in Silicon Valley and Los Angeles who isn't microdosing LSD these days is doing a ketogenic diet or a vegan diet. So now you can tell your patients, do this diet and try it and see if it works. And you know what lipid tests to do and what panels to do. And you're pretty confident that if they eat this way, their blood pressure will go down and their HDL will go up and their triglycerides will go down and their waist circumference will get smaller and their blood sugar will get under control. And if they're diabetic, you're pretty confident that you could get them off most to all of their diabetes medications and diabetes and obesity can in fact go into remission and you're not going to kill them and they can yeah. be pretty confident. So now you're so, speaking my language, the yeah. data that applies right to that patient. So, so you think, don't need a clinical trial anymore. Right. That's I, the and kicker. And do I need to know if the calories yeah. in, calories out or carbohydrate, insulin model, hormonal model, do I need to know which <clears throat> one is right or do I need to no, it's probably a combination of those. It's and probably why it's not a combination. But what I care more about, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, it's one or the other. They are alternative hypotheses. Well, so could you say that, would you say that calories do not matter at all? No, then? no. Calories are as good a way of any to measure the quantity of food you're eating. And right. I mean, you could use grams if you wanted to, and it might be just as good or even mouthfuls or something. But the idea is when I think about this, it's, I'm talking about understanding the etiology of this disorder. Yeah. Okay, I don't think ultimately, because it's not just about, I mean, diet will help a lot of people. And I think, but we got to prevent it. We got to, and it gets, it gets passed on from generation to right. generation, I believe. And so you really, we have to ultimately understand, we have to have a hypothesis of fat accumulation and how fat accumulation impact, like, you know, a, a subcutaneous fat accumulation, visceral fat accumulation and local and regional fat accumulation and how to fix it. And that our calories hypothesis doesn't tell you anything about that. It's a, that's what I mean. It's a, it has no value as a hypothesis. So if you tell a patient, look, go on this diet, just don't eat carbs, don't eat carbs and you could eat as much as you want of this. And then 30, 
you know, they, they lose, they have 100 pounds to lose and they only lose 20. And you're convinced that they're complying, they're not eating carbs and they're good, then you might say you might try eating less and see what happens. Or maybe you're having, them, you know, that you're getting 600 calories of the heavy cream and MCT oil and your Bulletproof coffees. Maybe you should try living without those. Or, you know, so it gets, there is value to telling people that maybe they're still overloading their system in such a way such that their fat tissue is hoarding fat, that we're trying to get it to give up. Right. But that's what I mean. It's sort of, so this whole, it gets wrapped up. People want to simplify things. They want to, they want catchy phrases. So they want it to be a calorie is a calorie versus calories don't count. And as soon as you say calories don't count, I've got an email from a New York Times reporter at the New York Times, and we're discussing this, and it's like, but I think calories do occasionally count. Like some people have, you know. Well, and on a, on a low-carb diet, in the free-living studies, people will naturally restrict their calories. So, yeah, but what if not everyone does? Not everyone does. So right? what good is it to have to tell people to eat less if some people might not? Right. And we all know people who at least think... I mean, we know, so I can think about what it was like to maintain weight loss on my low-fat, low-calorie diet that I would eat in the 80s, and basically I'm hungry all the time. Right. Okay. Exercising all the time, hungry all the time. Exactly. And I'm probably eating around 2,000 calories a day, and now it's, you know, 30 years later, 30, and I'm probably eating closer to 3,000 calories a day, and I maintain the weight loss effortlessly. Right. If it has nothing to do, what we want is I want a hypothesis that explains all of this. Is that and too good to be true? No. No, you this think is science. There. Yeah, it's yeah. just you have, but it's, as long as you're thinking in terms of this energy balance thing, you're, it's like, imagine a hypothesis of global warming that thought of it as energy balance. We, it's either too much energy entering the atmosphere or not enough energy getting out. So we know that the fact that the, the atmosphere is heating up tells us that more energy is going in than coming out, right? right. That's, that's, that's the laws of physics. But if we only think of it as an, in, an intake and outtake problem, like, yeah, we could probably cure global climate change by preventing some of that energy from going in. Okay. Okay. But what we want to do is stop the atmosphere from trapping energy, which is a problem. So I often think of obesity. It's a fat trapping problem. You know, the obesity epidemic is seven calories a day trapped in your fat tissue. That's like a quarter of a teaspoon worth of olive oil a day trapped in your fat tissue. Hmm. So now you tell someone to eat less. Yeah. How do you even know that if they cut their calories by 500 calories a day, they're gonna, their fat tissue is going to go, oh, yeah, we don't need that quarter of a calorie of olive oil. Let's get rid of it. Yeah, there's just no, you can't, if you think about it as a fat trapping disorder, then the whole calorie thing just vanishes. Okay. And that's, what, that's why I'm trying. That's, so I have various role models in life. When I'm writing at Sisyphus... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. With the nutrition the research and the nutrition field, it's Don Quixote, right? Tilting at windmills. Okay. With the energy balance hypothesis, it's Ahab. Ahab. Ahab, with all the implications, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how, where this is going to get me. But yeah. anyway. Well, I think that's, I mean, your, your path through this from physics to good and bad science to becoming involved in the nutrition world to then fighting again just for good science just shows how complex this is, especially in free-living individuals, and we can't ignore the psychological components of why people eat and how they eat. It's going to make it a very difficult job to find one answer to explain it all, and I'm I'm glad you're the man doing it because you you certainly have the thick skin to do it and you have the desire and the drive to do it. Well, remember, there there are questions that have simple answers and questions that have multifactorial complex answers. So if you ask the question like, you know, what is it in our society and our lives that makes all this food available and makes it so hard for us to stop eating all this crap that we consume too much of, however you define too much. Yeah. Then there's a whole world of answers about the food industry and socioeconomic status and behavior and what we're watching on TV and having our pantry. Um, 
me as a metaphor, I used to smoke cigarettes. I still miss cigarettes on occasions because they're very valuable when you're trying to... Nicotine's a great drug. Um, I couldn't quit smoking, Yeah. okay, when I lived in New York City because I would quit for a couple of weeks. I'd be walking down the street and there'd be somebody smoking on the street next to me and I'd smell like lilacs in springtime and I'd bum a cigarette from them before I could think twice. Or I'd go out to a bar with my friends after three weeks of quitting and this, I'd think, you know, they're all smoking and everybody's smoking their hands. Surely I could have one and I couldn't because I was an addict. And clearly, you know, it's these forces are at work. I went out to LA, moved to LA, and there I could quit because I used to joke if you wanted to bum a cigarette, you had to honk your horn and ask the person in the car next to you to roll down their window so they could <laughs> throw one into your car. You're never walking next to people on the street in New York. There was a distance between me and my addiction that I needed. And clearly there are all these issues. But if you're asking the question, what causes lung cancer? The answer is cigarettes. Smoking was the cause of lung cancer for 80% of the people who got lung cancer, or 80%. Of, um, if you ask the question, what causes the obesity and diabetes epidemics, individual variation doesn't really come into it. Clearly, there are people who can tolerate massive doses of sugar and live to be 100, just like there are people who can smoke two packs of cigarettes a day and live to be 100. But the argument I'm making, and I think that we're all pretty much in agreement, and that's becoming <laughs> conventional wisdom is that, you know, the causes are the sugar and refined processed carbohydrates that we consume. And so everyone, nobody's, I wasn't going to avoid lung cancer as long as I continued smoking. And if we want to put obesity and diabetes in a remission, you've got to remove the cause. So the fundamental thing for any, understanding any epidemic is what's the cause, what's the agent. That's a powerful analogy. And I think yeah. a, a very, very good place to wrap this up and leave it with that for our listeners. But I'd be curious if you have any any last tidbits or words for our listeners. And of course, where can they find you to learn more about you? Uh, well, they can find me on my website, garytobbs.com, which I don't blog as much as I should and Twitter and I don't do Instagram. Um, the, uh, yeah, what, I mean, again, it's the, the, a lot of this is about self experiment We've gotten to the point that people can try these diets without worrying about killing themselves. It helps if you have a physician who is helping you through the process, um, although there are sites like dietdoctor.com that I will recommend in my next book that are so good that I wonder why I'm even writing a next book. Um, but that's it. It's like if it works, we don't have to be scared anymore. And now you can get your lipids tested every month, You could, but you can see how people get healthier when they do these diets. And you don't need a clinical trial to tell you if you're getting healthier by doing this diet, by eating, by giving up carbs and replacing them with fat. Very good. Very good, Gary. Well, thank you very much. I okay. appreciate you coming on the show today. Thanks, Brian. And I look forward to seeing what comes next out of you for sure and your talk later today as well. Okay. Right, have a great day. Thanks. Thanks.